Too much talk in the back. The only speaking that should be heard is from up here for the next presentation now, please. We'll give you about another 30 seconds. Now, if everybody in the audience would stand and turn back to the back and say, shh, shh. We'll try it that way and see if it works as well as the whistle. I tend to prefer the whistle. I'm simply, you know, uh, tone deaf anyway. All right. As soon as well, that, that's just a, a rather quiet one there. When I see the signal back there, we will really knew it, and you probably wouldn't want to. But nevertheless, it's a fascinating topic as to what is coming next. R. E. McMaster Jr makes a pretty decent living advising people what to do, anticipating changes in the future in the various financial markets. His financial newsletter is in 40 countries plus, with thousands of subscribers that pay a pretty good fee <laughs> to get his advice. And so he has become amazingly wealthy in his life <laughs> short lifetime. <laughs> Uh, but we're happy to have him back with us after, as I tell him, recycling him for three years or so. Every so often we like to have him back and see what's coming off or what's going to happen. And in this case, Y2K may have been something that some of you have heard an odd thing or two about. And I know since he's in touch computer-wise with the whole globe, we're going to be interested in what he has to say about that and whatever else he wants to talk about. Oh, good. Give R. E. McMaster a big round of applause tonight. Well, I don't attempt to discern by what's going on in the markets by elevated plane consciousness that projects to the future. I'm just a good old-fashioned researcher that does a lot of reading and analysis and networking and thinking, and occasionally my intuition will, will kick in. Uh, so um, this will be my only presentation, I guess, except for the panel. Dean wants to be on the panel tomorrow. And uh, I'm not doing a workshop, but I did bring some things for you for free. And I have a newsletter back there on my table called What to Do About Y2K. And also I brought one on called The Cream of the Crop Part 2. I didn't, wasn't able to get the part one here. This has to do with uh, um, in, in time of a correction in the stock market where I think the best investments would be. In this particular newsletter, I talked about how gold stocks and energy stocks were uh, oversold. That was February 25th, and they've moved up something like 20 to 25 percent so far in the last two and a half weeks. So that's feeling pretty good. And in here, I also brought a brochure that's free called Peace of Mind Investing. Feel free to take one of those. And some of you had asked me if I was going to bring any of my books, and I did bring some. They are for sale, however. Um, I'm now part of the establishment, I guess, officially. And McGraw Hill just published one of my books. It said, said they said it was one of the 90 titles. One of 90 titles are going to publish this year. It's called The Art of the Trade. It's basically uh, two decades worth of analysis of what it takes to really trade and invest successfully in the markets. And then uh, I brought also my book of poetry that was published a couple of years ago for sale, called The a Highlander's Passion. Essays over the last 10 years that cover a whole broad spectrum of, of data called uh, The Power of Total Perspective. And then for this crowd, The Christ Within, which was a 17-year work, 476 pages. So that brings you up to date on what I've been doing anyway. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, basically what's going on in the markets right now and the economy and tie that into Y2K. So I'll, I'll give it a kind of a holistic view. And if we have uh, time later this evening, I'll take a few questions. It's important to recognize that there are four factors that are primary in any, in any economy. And, if you, and understanding how these four are interrelated will tell you what the economy is going to do. And with all the MIT-type 
uh, mathematic economic models these days and the, and the work coming out of Milton Friedman's Chicago School of Monstrous Thought uh, and the Keynesian economics that dominates Stanford and Yale and, uh, St and Harvard. We've lost touch with basic, good old-fashioned Austrian e economics. And yet the Austrian e economists are the ones that have given us the basic grounding in how we see and how the real world really works. And I'm talking about such men as Ludwig von Mises and Nobel Prize winner uh, Frederick Hayek. Um, Hans Sotholz at uh, Grove City College, Pennsylvania, pe people like that. But anyway, these four factors that have to do with the, the economy, and, and any ec economy, doesn't matter if it's U.S., Latin America, Asian, or Europe, are supply and demand. If you have less supply and more demand, prices are going to go up. If you have more supply and less demand, prices are going to go down. And in addition to that, in addition to that, the expansion and the contraction in the use of credit or debt and what has thrown a lot of economists, including the Federal Reserve, a curveball in this economic cycle is that it was usually easy to measure the expansion and the contraction of credit in our economy when the banks were primarily doing it. But now it's involved with the securitization of debt, of debt and, and markets and Freddie Mae and Fannie, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac creating all of these loans. And so what we've seen is a huge surge or growth in the money supply which has provide, provided a, a stealth inflation that's occurred in stocks, financial markets, and is now starting to flow over into real estate. But because of the chaos that occurred in Asia, Japan first, of course, being, you know, we're talking about the world's sixth largest economy there and number one foreign holder of, of, of international currency, and also the rest of Asia, Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, um, Malaysia, we had a depression, a contraction of credit over there and also basically a tremendous depreciation in the value of those currencies that led to a flow of funds artificially into U.S. dollars that artificially supported the U.S. dollar, dropped U.S. interest rates, and led to a flow of money into U.S. stocks. Same thing occurred to Europe in Europe prior to the coming on stream of the euro. Tremendous chaos and disagreement between the European central banks on how to create the euro. So we had funds that, was, that were invested in the like of Norway Corona, and Swiss Franc, and British Pound, and German D-Mark, and French Franc, that flowed out of Europe into the U.S. And ironically enough, even though the euro has declined about 6% since it came on stream January 1 of this year, in January, there were more, even though bonds issued in U.S. dollars were 47% of the total and in euros were 43% of the total, the reality was there were more bonds issued in, euro, in euros and Europe has a net positive trade balance than there were issued in U.S. dollars. So what that means is we've been living in an unusual once-in-a-lifetime type situation in this economy now through pretty much this decade of the 90s at a time where the American economy has had a huge increase in debt. Now, we're not, we're not talking about the, so much the increase in the federal deficit. Thanks to the booming stock market and capital gains, the federal deficit has gone down. But yet, we still have, you know, $5.6, $5.7 trillion worth of debt at the federal sector. Consumer debt has gone off the charts, thanks to now, which I think is outrageous, you know, second mortgaging of home to leverage and invest in the stock market. Consumer debt now exceeding $1.3 trillion. And then, of course, huge uh, business debt as well for takeovers, mergers, acquisitions, buying back the stocks, and, and, and excessive expansion. In addition to that, because so much of what we have been relying on to support the, the global economy has come from overseas, we're having something like 40 to 60 percent of the ships that come loaded from Asia go back empty, is that the U.S. consumer presently today is the primary supportive function that's keeping the global economy afloat. Russia is in total economic chaos, as is Eastern Europe. Europe itself now is in the process of again contracting. Africa, the average age in Africa in the next, by the next 10 to 12 years may be only 20 years thanks to the decimation of AIDS. With Brazil going down the tubes, there's, and Ecuador, by the way, declared a major banking holiday and financial crisis this year because of falling oil prices and their banks are in trouble down there. So Latin America's in trouble. Japan is not even close to recovering, and Asia's just struggling along, bouncing along bottom. So it's like, you know, in, in a dark world economically that's, that's, that's up to the, its gills in debt, the one shining hope has been the U.S. consumer, and the U.S. consumer is normally anywhere from 67 percent to two-thirds of economic borrowing and spending, but it, it's hit as high as 75 up to 80 percent and even a little bit higher in this, in this economic cycle, and primarily it's been used uh, with debt.
The problem with debt, however, is with an expansion of debt, eventually there becomes a contraction of debt. And so we're set up at a time where the, the U.S. consumer, the, the average American in terms of the overall scale, has a negative savings rate for the first time in history because uh, uniquely the mindset for the first time in history is that stocks are seen as savings. But stocks are not cash historically. They're not savings like bank CDs or treasury bills or hard cash or things of that nature. And all this stuff is coming at a time when the business cycle is maturing, when the stock market in real terms peaked out April of last year of last year, and we're seeing primarily what is supporting it now. It's, it's, like, an, it's like the Titanic whose engines have been, have been cut. It's still floating forward, and because we're the only country, or one of only basically four countries that have really made significant preparations for Y2K, we're still seeing scared foreign money come into U.S. Treasury bills, U.S. T-notes, uh, two years or less, key 50 to 100 key blue chip U.S. stocks, and and then we're seeing the speculation in the high flying stocks. And so it is uh, a very unstable environment at best where basically the best minds I, I know and work with, I had dinner last Friday night with an international money manager that handles oh, close to $500 million for Greek shipping, shipping magnets and magnates and also for a wealthy Mexican industrialist. And he, he and the, and the uh, 12 or so other guys to get together every year in Europe handle about $25 billion between them. All of them are, are scared to death right now. And the American consumer is basically, you know, pretty complacent. But that's the difference with someone that understands economics and been in money for a long time versus what is now the equivalent in our economy of where Japan was debt-wise, stock market-wise, real estate-wise in 1989-1990. So... That, that gives you a sense of uh, some of the problems of where we are right now. Now, you can imagine with Y2K coming up that if we get this break in the stock market bubbles, I mean, we have the internet stocks, excuse me, internet stocks, <laughs> which are very thinly traded, which are extremely volatile, and you've got a few stocks on the NASDAQ, something like 25 that accounted for 100% of the gains over the past year and nearly all the gains this year and 50 to 100 big blue chip stocks and, and like Amazon.com and, and Microsoft and, and a few of those, but it's very, very narrow, very, very narrow breadth. And the other 4,000 some odd stocks uh, and the NASDAQ are not going anywhere, are going down. So it's, so it's, like, it's like all the airplanes are in the sky, but most of them are going down, but only, the only thing that the cameras and, and the spotlights are focusing on are the very few that are still up there. So it's, it's, it's a disguised stock market decline and so far it's kept up the perception of public confidence and that's really important because when consumer spending or basically borrowing is the basis of what's going on in the economy confidence is absolutely critical why because anytime we borrow we borrow from the future by mortgaging the past to consume in the present so we're assuming the future is going to be an extension of the present. And when our confidence shifts, we either hold steady or we back off. In that case, the nature of contraction of debt because of the compounding nature of interest is debt will contract. So stagnation in the stock market, stagnation in consumer borrowing is a negative because the net effect of compounding interest forces a contraction. Besides, if T-bonds are yielding four times what stocks are yielding, why be in stocks that are moving sideways that are yielding about 1.5%? And that is the issue at stake right now. And I, I suspect, with all the preparations that are being made by the National Guard, and, and, and all, not only in this country, but also in Canada, that white, and as widely publicized as the Y2K problem has, has been, should we get into a financial and economic crunch? And we have had some in Asia, we've had one in, in Brazil that has been very, very threatening to the international banking order. Y2K might be a very, very convenient reason to declare a banking holiday to uh, a period of, na of uh, national emergency, martial law, and things of that nature. And so, if it's necessary, they could very easily pull that trigger without upsetting the mindset of the American public. The American public would really not understand what's going on in terms of the financial and economic environment. Let's talk a little bit about the debt cycle in terms of the expansion and contraction of credit because it really is a human action cycle. If you start, well, let's say, with the Depression, after a while, as a result of the Depression, people save money. 
As a result of savings, there is the development of confidence. Confidence, in turn, leads to investment. Investment leads to economic activity. Economic activity leads to increased confidence. That, in turn, leads to borrowing or lending. That expands the money supply. Each dollar can be multiplied oh, up to seven times in the banking system in the leverage by which US, uh, uh, Japanese yen were borrowed at 1%. They were leveraged at 100 to 1 in some cases to then invest in US dollars that were yielding on, in Treasury bonds 5% or so, about 5.5% of the time. And as long as the dollar went up, the yen went down, it was like shooting ducks in a barrel. And there were a lot of big speculators and hedge funds and big banks that were, got real wealthy in a hurry off of stuff like that. Most of us aren't, aren't, don't have the ability to play that game, wouldn't know where to start. But that's, that's the nature of what's happening out there in these highly leveraged, incredibly highly leveraged financial markets these days. In fact, people say, well, I'm holding my, I owe my cash stocks. It doesn't matter because the, the debt and the leverage underlying the markets these days is so huge that the tail wags the dog. What happens in the futures contracts of the S&P, Dow futures, uh, crude oil, gold, uh, T-bonds, et, et cetera, determines what happens to the underlying cash value of those securities. So is the world one big Las Vegas type leveraged financial casino crapshoot today? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that comes because we're this far along in the business cycle. Because this lending leads to more frenetic investing, more increased consumer borrowing and spending, then excessive business and real estate expansion, excessive business, in other words, excess capacity, excess productivity. That's what led to the crash in Asia. In Thailand, it was one little domino that, that precipitated the whole thing. What it come from? Too much lending for real estate projects, not enough demand. Uh, as a result, the prices went down, banks had to close, had call the loans, and then one country led to a ripple to the other. And let me ask you a question, this is a theoretical question. You know, if we buy the quantum idea that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Asia, it has an effect over here because, in a sense, all we're connected in the quantum, right? Right? We, right? Okay, now question. If all this has happened in Japan and in Asia and all, and all the, the, the uh, basically tiger economies who's had, their, who's had their tails cut off lately, and in Latin America and, and Russia and Eastern Europe, why all of a sudden are we a rock and an island that has no effect on us, as we're told? I mean, there's some inconsistency here. Pardon me, but, you know, the, the great dam, so to speak, that's held it back so far has been this incredible increase in, in debt, the Clinton Plunge Protection Team that basically mess, messes with the Treasury and also the Federal Reserve in buying and selling futures contracts affecting arbitrage or spreads between these various in financial instruments to hold up the stock market, consumer borrowing, business borrowing, and that's what's doing it. And so it's been critical to keep confidence up in order to maintain the global economy. That's why uh, the reg the, the uh, Clinton administration has been so absolutely insistent on Japan kick-starting its economy, Europe kick-starting its economy, because they were concerned at some point in time if we plateau or just ease down a, a bit, uh, it could be a, a feather hitting a house of cards that could send, send it tumbling. Okay, continuing, continuing this business cycle example, you have excessive business and real estate borrowing and expansion, excessive consumer spending through debt. Eventually what you have is a loss of confidence, a loss of confidence. That leads to an economic or stock market contraction or stagnation, which ultimately leads to a recession. And then you have things moving down. Let me hold questions until later, if I could, please. Okay, as I mentioned, in April 1998, the U.S. stock market effectively topped. In 1998, 25 NASDAQ stocks, such as Microsoft, Dell, and Cisco, and I live outside of Austin. And you know, this is a sign of top, of top because they call the people that work for Dell there, Dellionaires. Not millionaires, but they're Dellionaires. And, and so you find, I, I guess, the, the greatest sales of BMW dealerships are now in Austin, Texas. And those are the kind of things you always see that occur around the market top. 50 to 100 blue chips, uh, big cap stocks moved up, as I mentioned, the internet stocks. Because the U.S. stock market and the economy has literally been the only game in town. So where are, uh, where are smart money, where is smart money moving right now? Smart money has been moving into stocks, into a few selected income stocks that were part of my a first cream of the crop issue, stocks that were returning 8, 10, 12 percent that have already been sold off, that in case of a stock market sell-off does well. Stocks that have been beat down below book value, out of favor, oil, oil stocks, all service stocks, uh, some mining stocks, as I mentioned, so I mentioned those in the February 25th reaper, they moved up 20, 25 percent or so. Uh, into cash. I mean, there's increasing portfolios being put into cash, and that includes 
U.S. Treasury bills, 90-day Treasury bills or less. Uh, T-bills, or money markets invested in T-bills. CDs per owner of $100,000 or less in, in banks. Uh, the, uh, and I have also in some of these reefers uh, what I call a pie chart showing the distribution of assets for a more conservatively managed portfolio. Uh, I think we're, we'll see the euro move up here before very long. And my favorite currencies there, in terms of both the European currencies as well as an oil play, would be the Norway Corone, the British pound would have a play, Swiss franc still shows re greater relative strength against the uh, German mark, and the other euro currencies in addition to the euro itself. In Asia, if we have, if we have any move in the gold market, and there is a tremendous, anyone, anyone care anything about gold here? Few people, okay, about half, ha, all right. What's happening in the gold market, gold needs to clear $300 an ounce before it's going to go anywhere. And, and, for the, and this is really an anomaly in the market. For the first time in the, all the years I've traded the markets, we have the primary producers wanting the gold price to stay down. Because what's happened is that the central banks, about 80 of them, have either sold but primarily have loaned their gold out to gold mining companies, gold producers, who have then in, sold it short and or sold contracts of future short. Let's say they sold, they sold 100 ounces of gold short and, and, and basically only put down 5% of margin on it. So they've made money as gold prices have gone down to offset their own production. The problem is this gold is running about, oh, at least 1,000 to 1,200 uh, tons annually of, of deficit and it's being consumed in, by jewelry in the marketplace. So if there's ever a short squeeze in the gold market where these primary producers have to scramble, they're going to have to go in the market and buy it back because the gold that they, that they sold has been, been consumed. And so we have this un unusual artificial situation in the gold market where it is artificially depressed at the same time where the, artif where the U.S. dollar is artificially supported. It's like, it's like the great illusion has become reality in this country today. And it, it's, a, it's a phenomena that, that causes um, international money managers and uh, sophisticated economists, I'm not talking about those on TV, to really shake their head and wonder how long until someone comes out with a pen and goes, pop. So, with that basic overview, I thought I, what I would do now, since I have back there what to do about Y2K, later on in my talk, if I, don't have, if I have enough time, I'll run through some of the preparations, but those are pretty well listed here in this newsletter. And like I said, those are back on the back table, and if we run out, I'm sure you can have the front desk uh, copy some of them for you. I want to bring to your attention some of the key information I've seen about Y2K, because um, th th there's, been so, there's been so much information about it that's, that's contradictory that uh, as I followed it for the last couple of years or so, I have gleaned and I pulled from, our, from, our, from my computer for this talk the key evidences I thought would be significant in terms of your personal planning. First of all, only about 35% of the more critically important federal government systems have been fixed. That's all. Only about a third. The General Accounting Office said it's unlikely that even the remaining 5,000 mission critical systems can be corrected in time. Gosh, what would we do without a, our government working? I know this is going to bring tears of joy. No. <laughs> okay. And it's more important to remember that many of these systems are interdependent, and those 5,000 essential systems are priority fixes and can be multiplied exponentially. There are about 60,000 non-mission critical federal systems that also need savings, and defense is not expected to be finished with the needed repairs until 2009. 2009. Okay. Uh, here's, here's one you're really going to regret. Word now is from several private Y2K companies that the IRS computer programs are exiting in droves. They're applying for high paying jobs in the private sector. In fact, so those that are left have so, such poor computer skills, they do not think the IRS has a ghost of a chance of being prepared for Y2K by the turn. That, well, that was an un-American clack clap, wasn't it? <laughs> hmm. Okay. Well, well, let me talk to you about a, the chip on your shoulder, so to speak. What if you have 25 billion chips floating around the world, worldwide, that have to be fixed? Okay? And just one-tenth of one percent means 25 million chips are kicking around with a Y2K problem. How are you going to find them? Can you imagine that, finding that many Easter eggs? 
45% of the world's financial organizations, 70% of the world's information systems professionals are not fully informed about Y2K. Two-thirds of top corporate executives, this is, these are guys at the top, do not think the Y2K problem will be fixed by the year 2000. And of course, once again, they're even aware that the IRS will not be compliant by the year 2000. Question has to, has to do, and this is a serious concern among some companies, what about foreign or governments and organizations hostile to the U.S. if they decide to exploit the Y2K problem? What about our chips that are embedded in key oil wells around the country? Uh, what about um, international students that have been here that are now working in, in top secret high-tech information uh, on the Y2K problem? What happens then if, it's, if uh, they decide to sabotage it? I mean, it's an unknown out there. Never before we had a situation where we had people working on, on our computer systems in very sensitive industrial and military areas where there was no way of knowing if they, in fact, fixed it or not, or, in fact, if they Im uh, implanted a virus or a bug of some type. If every computer program in the programmer in the world now started to correct the Y2 problem, it would take six years. Six years. Many of the programs were written in, in COBOL and FORTRAN, which are old machine languages and very few co uh, uh, computer technicians or programmers know how to handle that anymore. I was flying on, on Delta. I upgraded. I've got a lot of miles on them now. I usually try to upgrade first class when I can. With a fellow who is now, I guess, 65, been in computers his whole life, he says, you would not believe the offers I'm getting now to come back to work because I understand COBOL and Fortran. He said, he said they're just, you know, they're, they're six figuring up because there's, people are just desperate, companies are just desperate to get help. And he said the federal government can't, can't even compete. Okay, you want to hear what the CIA director said? Anybody care about him? He warned that the year 2000 computer glitch could help adversaries penetrate critical use businesses, government, and defense computers. My gosh, we might have to declare martial law or an emergency, a national emergency. We thought that was the case, mightn't we? See, we've got a lot of reasons, a lot of excuses for national uh, declaration of national emergency or martial law. A CIA concern, many of the programs working on the problem are non-Americans and, and or, foreign programs, or, or foreign programs that have been produced internationally. The bugs have been implanted and programs stolen. The Federal Reserve and the federal government are preparing for a national state of emergency. The use of executive orders, martial law. U.S. military units are being trained to isolate and contain 120 cities in the U.S. That's about 80% of the U.S. population. The banking system is preparing for a run. Countries where, the, where uh, Y2K progress has been made are primarily the U.S., Canada, Netherlands, Australia, Belgium, and Sweden. It's been advised that you don't travel <laughs> the first part of, 1990, of the year 2000 on an international airline or any place else, but I would tell you this is fun. The Chinese government has declared that every airline executive will take a flight on New Year's Day, the year 2000. <laughs> Can you imagine if every FAA official in charge of every airport and every airline executive was required to take a flight on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day of the year 2000? Do you think their pucker factor and effort and motivation to get Y2K fixed might go up a bit? <laughs> I thought that was cute. Oh, oh let's see what else. Hmm. Oh, the Wisconsin National Guard has already been told it's going to be mobilized. Mm -hmm. Japan's industry ministry said that more than 30% of the country's small companies have yet to take measures to even start combating it. So that means Japan is basically very quiet about this problem, but has taken no effort basically to, uh, to, get it, to get, become Y2K, comp Y2K compliant. How am I doing time-wise? You don't know. You're having such a, I'm, I'm so spellbonding you don't even know, right? I'm 33 minutes left. Three minutes left? Oh, I have a lot of time. I, won't we talk slower? Okay. Here are the grades that were given by the House Subcommittee on Y2K. Uh, the IRS got a D, as in failed. The Justice Department, only 18% compliant. Treasury Department, 44%. State Department, zero. Here's a good one. FEMA, only 50% Y2K compliant. Ha-ha. Then, you know, that's a Federal uh, Emergency Management Association. Okay, uh, Defense Department 27%, Transportation 11%, that's an issue because one of the main concerns we have, two concerns that I have are in the medical area, hospitals, because there's so many downstream employees and suppliers that even I checked with a major hospital in Denver and they know they won't be compliant at the earliest until April of next year. 
And also the food industry is a, is a major concern because there's so many small mom and pop operations and because of our what's known as quote just in time unquote inventory policy where you only get inventory there at the last minute when you need it. In other words, there's no stockpiling of inventory anymore. Those two areas, medical and also a food supply, could be a real concern in Y2K, which would be a basis, of as would be transportation, which would be a basis, of course, for declaring what? Martial law, a national emergency. So I do think it makes some sense to have some modest preparations um, by way of medical, food, water, things and that going into the year 2000, as you would if you knew there was going to be a major flood in your area or a major snowstorm where power would be knocked out for any period of time. Uh, industry in this country is affected. For example, here's what GM said. Automaker GM says in its, in its examination of potential Y2K problems, it's turned up about 1.7 million computer devices, 1.7 million, that control everything from robots that weld car bodies together to the heat and light at its plants. Additionally, big automakers have more than 150,000 suppliers worldwide who face similar problems from Y2K. Since automakers often hold less than a day's supply of parts and inventory, that's, that's just as kind inventory management, less than a day's supply of parts. And, so you might want to make sure you have a new car or at least one that works well so you don't have a just-in-time car th situation. Uh, any, two y two, any Y2K prob two K problems anywhere along the supply production line will rapidly bring all production to a halt. Overseas suppliers are a particular concern, according to industry officials, because awareness of the Y2K problem outside of the U.S. just simply is not that high. As I mentioned, there are only five countries that are really prepared. All the companies are so worried that some are expected to stockpile key parts or line up alternate sources in case suppliers' assurance of Y2K compliance proves incorrect. And it's likely to. You know, Murphy's Law, if anything will go wrong, it will, could very well hit there. Additionally, of, the, of these 25 billion embedded computer chips, some of the places that are located are bank vaults, hospital equipment, electrical switching devices of power companies, water treatment plants, and nearly every enterprise you can really think of. Uh, if we took a B in matchsticks and laid them side by side, they would, they'd reach from New York City to Los Angeles, California. If you multiply that by 25, that's how many chips have to be dealt with. It's a lot of chips. Maybe it was easier when we had, the Indians were here and we had buffalo. Then we had real chips. Real fuel, too. <laughs> For those of us live in the West, I know you understand that. Those of you live in the city, I won't explain it. It's all right. <laughs> Present time, this, this is data. Only 15%, 1-5% of the banking, computer, manufacturing, insurance, investment, pharmaceutical companies are, are expected to have some kind of Y2K problem. So in other words, 15% have already been recognized as definitely having some kind of problem. But a third of the aerospace, biotech, consulting, heavy equipment, medical equipment, publishing, software, semiconductors, telecommunication, and retail are going to definitely have a Y2K problem. Nearly 50%, half, of the chemical processing, transportation, power, natural gas, water, oil, medical practice, ocean shipping, television, and law enforcement will have Y2K problems. So you would expect the need personally to make preparations in that area. And my, my perception is basically uh, is that we're going to have problems for anywhere from up to a year and a half and probably severely in the first three to six months. So what I'm basically doing is spending some weekends camping out in my house with nothing and seeing what I need basically to camp out in my house just like I was camping out in the National Forest in Montana and stockpiling things that I would use anyway Rather than living like most of us do, just in time inventory, where we go to the grocery store every, you know, every week and buy what we need for that week, stockpiling the things we need ahead of time because prices aren't going down anyway, are they? No, not at the retail level. So it's just a, just a way of, of inventory management at the home level, similar to what some of these auto manufacturers are doing at the, uh, at the factory level. And again, I discussed this at length in this Reaper, what to do about Y2K. Okay. Okay. Um, now here's, here, I mentioned food, two-thirds of the agriculture, food processors, city and town services, city and town services, farming, education, and government agencies will have a Y2K problem. So we, would you like me to read again those that have half or two-thirds just so you can hear those again? Okay, one more time. 50% chemical processing, transportation, power, natural gas, water, oil, medical practice, Ocean shipping, television, law enforcement, 50%. Two-thirds in agriculture, food processing, city and town services, 
Farming, education, government agencies are going to have a Y2K problem. And this is not according to the federal government. This is called the, according to the Gartner Group, that, that re reliable private enterprise up in uh, Connecticut. DuPont found that a third of its suppliers uh, and 40 percent of the people it dealt with were at high risk for Y2K. That's cl clearly right at that 40, 50 percent uh, cutoff mark for uh, chemical processing. Only 15 percent of companies as I mentioned, 15% 50, 50 of companies in developed nations of all type will have at least one mission critical failure, and that is up to two-thirds in, in countries that are other than the five that I mentioned out outside the United States. So the question becomes, will we be even able to get the goods that we've been buying as consumers in the year 2000 if these other countries are not compliant? That becomes a question. So if we want to spend, will we be able to? And by the way, we're now importing a record amount of our oil, nearly two, 10 million barrels a day, up to almost 70 percent of our oil is imported from, er from areas and countries that are politically unstable, Nigeria, Venezuela, and of course in the Middle East. Uh, counties, only half the, count half the counties nationwide don't even have a plan to tackle Y2K. H over half the counties nationwide, not even uh, a plan yet. Uh, truth is th thousands of cities and, and counties have not done what's even necessary to begin planning for Y2K. Let's assume there is an 85 percent fix rate, and we only have that 15 percent. This is, you know, best, best scenario. If that happens, we'll still have 2.2 million people that will lose their jobs. Unemployment will rise 2.2 percent. 275,000 people will have to declare bankruptcy. 15 percent of the nation's homes will be without power for five days and without phone service for three. Air, road, sea, and rail transport could be interrupted for weeks. There is the distribution issue. You follow me on this? and stocks would lose at least 10 percent of their value. Now, in that situation, how many of you are going to be willing to go out and flagrantly borrow tremendous amounts of money for consumer expenditures? Probably not many. And your neighbors won't either. And remember, the nature of compound interest is, is, is like a treadmill that keeps going. Unless boring increases, Unless, by the consumer and businesses, unless stocks keep going up, their natural inclination is to go down. Markets top when there are no more buyers, not when they're sellers. Markets top when there are no more buyers. And so you've got a factor here at a time that we're already, you know, pretty much maxed to the limit and the only shining light in the world economically when the trickle effect of just a little bit of wind from Y2K could cause contraction. Do, do these Y2K statistics help you link together some of my early remarks of where we, where we stand economically so you get a feel for how these things are coming together here o over this next year? For those of you that aren't asleep, please nod yes. Or if you're already heads down, I'll take that as a nod yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. How about abroad? In Germany, only 8% of major companies have a formal program to deal with Y2K. In Germany, for heaven's sakes, which is the lead Trojan horse in the euro, only 8%. Poland, Hungary, and, and, and the Czech Republic have lost all their programmers to, to develop countries in Europe and this country. They're not going to be even close. In a Asia, no contest there either. Um, let's see what the U.S., by the way, gets 95 percent of its foreign goods through seaports, not one of which is Y2K compliant. Not a single seaport is yet Y2K compliant. The airline industry is non-compliant. Non not one commercial jet airport is compliant anywhere on earth yet. The Sabre reservation system is not yet compliant. Local travel agents are not compliant. Now question, do you think the insurance industry is going to insure these flights <laughs> in the year 2000? Okay, if they don't, you think the company's board of trustees are going to take the li liability of all these planes to fly uninsured? <laughs> or you think the banks that loan the money are going to be happy with these airlines if they do? So you get a sense of this whole domino. Inter See, the whole nature of our market is we have a wonderful market that provides us with unequal goods and services never before seen on the face of the earth. And it's because of one factor that economists call the specialization and division of labor, where each of us does what we do best. And as long as we're just, you know, this little technician that does what we do best, and everybody else does what they do best, we have this wonderful stream or, inter or infrastructure of communications and transportation distribution, everything works fine. But we're no longer where 90 percent live off the land or self-sufficient. And you have one segment breaks down in this highly specialized economy that has this 
you know, unique specialization division of labor, then the domino effect basically starts to ripple everywhere else. So there's not only, the, it's like the chips do fall, so to speak, just like dominoes. And one sector affects other sectors of the economy. I remember when I was in, uh, in Texas, when the oil crunch hit, I was speaking to the Houston Rotary Club and I told them that oil, oil was about $25 a, bo a barrel that I said, when this was back in the 80s, when oil drops through 24, it's going to drop non-stop -so to 12. You could hear this huge sucking sound in the, in the Houston Rotary Club. <gasps> well, it, it happened about two and a half weeks later. It, it fell through 24, it dropped to 12. Turned out oil was only 10% of the Texas economy. But because it was heavily leveraged, it devastated in the 80s the te Texas economy. Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin. Lake houses west on, the, on, the, on the lakes west of Austin dropped 40 to 60 percent in price in 12 to 18 months. And that was just 10 percent of the economy, which was, the, which was an oil price drop from 24 to 12 dollars a barrel. So it gives you a sense of, of what, what can happen in a small segment of the economy that affects everything else. In summary, this is why Y2K is like nothing man has ever seen before in his history. It threatens every system simultaneously. It is systemic. It does not need to shut down every computer and every organization in order to create havoc. It only has to shut down a fraction of the existing producers who supply others who will then go bankrupt, which will bankrupt still others. The supply lines are, com the supply lines are complex. The capital markets are fragile. As Businesses w Business Week war wrote, this is an establishment publication, and it's in this December 14, 1998 issue, quote, Y2K is worse than anyone thought. The final reckoning for the bug could hit dollar sign one trillion dollars. One trillion dollars. Okay, some of the deadlines. Y2K deadline. April Fool's Day, April 1, 1999, coming right up. Fiscal year for Japan, Canada, and New York State. First date to watch, coming right up. July 1, 1999, fiscal year for 44 states. August 22, 1999, the global positioning system of satellites rolls back. September 9, 1999, 9999, end of file archive data. And October 1, 1999, fiscal year for the U.S. government. So these are key dates to start watching to see what kind of problems we have. <coughs> Pardon me. What about getting your money out of the bank? Well, the Federal Reserve has, has widely publicized, has printed another $200 billion of cash to handle Americans' needs. That's a drop in the bucket. I, th I do think it makes some sense to hold some, some cash greenbacks, ones, fives, tens, actually cash greenbacks. And, and, there's a, and you know, there was a, started to be a regulation known as know your customer where the banks had to profile everybody who took out money. If I were taking money out for Y2K, and I would store most of it in a safe deposit box, and that, I, I've done that personally, I would let my bank know this is what I'm doing and this is why and have them fill out a currency reporting rep uh, report. So let's say you, you decided you have two years savings, saved up, you decided to take out three to six months in cash and five, tens, ten. No, no, you just take a precautionary measure. You're going to put it, you know, you're going to store it right here in the bank in the safe deposit box, and here's what it's for, and you fill out the treasury reporting re requirement. I don't think there'll be a problem. The last thing you want to do is structure it or do it clandestinely because that could get you in trouble, L trouble that will throw you in jail almost overnight where they throw away the key. So be upfront about it and clearly reported, and I think the better the paperwork in a situation like this, uh, you'll, be, you'll be best served. But let's talk about the banks. Banks have about dollar sign 3.7 trillion in deposit liabilities. That's money they owe depositors. How much do they have in reserves to meet the money they owe th to these depositors? Counting all the different categories, they have about 44 billion in reserves for the 3.7 trillion in deposit liabilities. Now, do I need to do the math on this for you? <laughs> If you, uh, I will. if you divide 44 billion by 3.7 trillion, you get 1.16%. For every $100 deposited, the banking system reserves are $1.16. Obviously, if everyone went to the bank to get their money, only two things could happen. First, the first 1.16 people, the people in line, would get all their money, and the rest would get nothing. <laughs> no Easter eggs for you. <laughs> Or second, everyone in line would get $1.16 for every $100 they had deposited. Now, do you think in that kind of situation, there might be, if, if this thing, if, if we had a, just people wanting to go to the bank very calmly, lining up, just like they're queuing up for this rock concert out here, and waiting to get their money out of the bank in, let's say, anywhere from 15 to 16 states, and the banks ran out of money, there might be the tendency to declare a national emergency 
or martial law or something of that nature or all of a sudden we can't, you know, we, we have trouble getting food across the country or the supermarkets run a little short or maybe the water system or the water treatment system in some city doesn't work. There, there might be just the tendency for the states to either take action and or the federal government to take action just to make sure everyone knows, as Alexander said, Haig said, I'm in control here. I'm in charge here. What do you think? Think there's a chance of that? Not this group. I'm sure this group is. We, have a, we all have good reason to have faith in Bill Clinton. Okay. Uh, how much time? 16 minutes. Uh, I could go through this Y2K, what to do about it. You want me to go through some of that in terms of basic? Oh, you do? Okay. You don't want to read? Okay. This, you want me to feed you tonight? Okay. I will. Okay. Eight categories of preparation for Y2K. One, water. Two, food. Three, shelter. Four, fuel. Five, cash. Six, medical supplies. Seven, protection. And eight, border, what I call border and charitable items. Let me run over these, uh, these categories uh, in more detail. My approach basically is to, as I mentioned earlier, is to primarily buy things that I need and would use anyway. So I'm kind of being my own inventory manager here. I'm just stockpiling more than normal. Uh, I may spend, oh, probably maybe a thousand, couple thousand dollars extra on extra items just in, by way of preparation. And you're, everything I'm buying is like, like a Costco, Sam's, or Walmart. So I'm not doing anything exotic. Water. You got to have water, maybe do, doing such things as filling up your swimming pool, putting a cover on it. Here's an idea, buying a couple dozen old hot water heaters and just filling, putting them in the garage and just filling them with water. That's cheap. Uh, uh, you can also uh, buy these five-gallon containers and, and store them. You buy those at, in most of the discount houses. Putting water uh, drains and collectors on your house and having, uh, having tubs at the end of them to collect rainwater or having a system if you're, if you're on slopes to have plastic uh, potential containers by way they can funnel in water that way. That's all the basic things to do for water. Food, uh, again, a three to six month supply, what I would think would be the max. And I, again, buy, buy food that you're going to use. Buy food that you're going to use and just rotate it way, way of inventory. And you can buy that at bulk at, at a Costco or a Sam's. Uh, you might want to buy like a Coleman stove, enough fuel to cook on, or if you have a, have a wood stove, put an extra cart of wood in. So freeze, freeze dried foods wouldn't be a bad idea. If you do a garden, it's a, good, it's a good time to have a gardener and also some non-hybrid seeds. Uh, nuts and cooking oil, don't forget those. And a few candy bars and things that help you feel good when you're, when, when you're like you were out camping. You know, you don't want to make this powdered Gatorade. That was one thing I bought, powdered Gatorade. I like Gatorade. <laughs> and I can't, I, and I said, once again, try camping out in your house. See what it's like. Turn off the power. Turn off the water. Just try camping out for a weekend or maybe, you know, for a couple of days. See what, see what you see. See what you find out. Shelter. Uh, ideally, you, you'd want to be in your own home. Uh, and I, I look at my shelter as a place to camp out inside of. So um, it means I'm looking at, at warmer clothes, sleeping bags, tents, air mattresses, things of, the, of that nature, where fuel use is at a minimum. Or if I have fuel in my home, it's something like for, for like a, I put an insert in, into my fireplace so I can use it as a wood cook stove as well. I think fuel may very well be in short supply. Uh, that is why, you know, having a Coleman's type, type stove, uh, food that basically is, is freeze dried or that can be uh, eaten and consumed without cooking is a good idea. Again, sleeping bags that are good for low temperatures, warm clothes, things of that nature, where basically if you were, you were camping out and you didn't have the fuel available, you could, you could survive in your home without a problem. As I mentioned in cash, I, th I think, you, you know, you might want to hold a few big bills. I wouldn't say anything really larger than a 20 is really of much use in that type of situation. Uh, and I, think it's, I don't think you ought to store it at home. I think you ought to keep it stored in the bank. I think you will have access to the bank and bank's safe deposit boxes during such times. Medical supplies, I think, will be critical. Medical supplies, I think, it will be critical. Uh, that, uh, one of the things we take for granted are prescription medicines and over-the-counter medicines that are readily available. I think it makes sense to have a, a good six-month-to-year supply of those available while, while, while they're available. Then protection. Now, this is an area. I'm going to read you what I wrote about protection because most, uh, most of I know what most of you are thinking here. Here's where an area where many people fall short. And I'm not necessarily talking about guns and bullets or bulletproof vests or reloading equipment or bows and arrows or slingshots, wrist rockets, or even all, that, even all of that could be useful. I'm not particularly recommending night vision goggles or perimeter wire, trip wire security systems. But what about non-electric alarm clocks? 
How about fire extinguishers? What about diapers, personal hygiene supplies, soaps, deodorant, toothpaste, tampons, etc.? How about birth control devices, things of that nature? We're talking about protection in the broadest sense of the word. How about learning to be physically aware? How many times at night? I mean, have you heard a noise and you knew it wasn't normal and you said, it's just going to go away? I mean, that's human nature, right? We hear a noise at night and we think, no big thing. Now, I was trained as an Air Force pilot. I went through land survival school, water survival school, combat urban rifle school, you know, got chased around Guatemala with people shooting at me for about a year. And one of the things you, you learn, is, when, particularly at least when you're flying, is you see some movement or you see some perspective, you hear something that doesn't sound right, you check it out. When in doubt, check it out. That's, a, that, that's a, a good motto. When in doubt, check it out. And so one of the things you might do to prepare yourself mentally and emotionally is say, if I hear something that's unusual, then I'm going to check it out. When in doubt, check it out. Don't assume it's nothing. I think it's a good way to live anyway, whether, you, you know, in terms of your car, in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, in your home. I remember, remember one time I woke up and just felt something was unusual. And, and I sensed something was unusual. The more you, you, you investigate those intuitive senses or those unusual, in, that, that unusual sensory input that you're not used to paying attention to, the more sensitive you will become to your environment. It turned out I went downstairs and someone left a burner on and my kitchen was on fire. Well, okay. What if I decided to roll over on that Sunday morning and just gone back to sleep? Might have been able to sing eternally, smoke gets in your eyes. <laughs> Point is, in a Y2K situation, you want, to be, you want to become environmentally alert. Those of you that spend any time in the woods or nature know that when you're out there, you learn to trust your eyesight, your sense of smell, and also your sense of hearing in terms of perceiving your environment. That is something that we've become desensitized to in, in our modern world where we are basically very, very comfortable. That is an unusual situation for the rest of the world. I guarantee you it's unusual in Venezuela right now. It's, un, it's unusual in Ecuador. It's unusual in Brazil. It, 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 it do not, does not exist in the former Soviet Union in Russia. It's unusual in Western Europe. It's a it, it, very, very unusual day in Indonesia. Singapore is on alert. Malaysia, Thailand. It's just an awareness factor, being aware uh, of the environment. And finally, I, do, I, I, I don't believe that every man's an island. I believe, I believe we all need each other. And there's no way that any of us are going to prepare totally for everything we need. And that's why you want to stockpile things that you can use for barter or trade or just to be a good Samaritan in terms of local charity to help out your fellow man. Because we don't live in a community anymore that's bonded by common beliefs. We live in a neighborhood which is basically a mishmash of people of different income levels, or maybe they're the same income levels who have different belief systems, who have different activities. And in a situation like Y2K, if there is a national emergency, all of a sudden they're going to have to bond as a community or a commune having something in common. And that's alien right now to American way of life, by and large, out in the major cities. It exists somewhat in the smaller towns, but not in the cities. And so getting to know who, who, who your neighbors are and, and, and having some com involved in some com community activity and stockpiling for community problems, uh, I think makes sense. I think, it's, I think it always pays to be a good Samaritan, regardless of where you are and what you're doing. Okay, well, let me open it up for questions. Uh, before, before you do that, yeah. Turn the lights on, please, in, in this Turn room up front. We have a microphone open. here so that everybody can hear the question. If you want right. to ask questions, please uh, queue up. Behind the microphone back here, where I am. I'm back behind you. Where This is where the microphone is, so everybody can hear it. So who's uh, first? Okay. If you, please, if you have a question, go to the back and, and uh, address the mic. Yes, sir. Yes, I had a question uh, concerning Japan. Um, as we all know, or perhaps we don't know really how bad it is in Japan. We just know it's unusual there. Understand that... Um, their deficits are really huge and their banking system's in terrible shape. What is the possibility that, let's say, in the spring following their March 31 right. fiscal year, right. uh, they might make a demand for uh, repayment of debt through the U.S. Treasury? Okay. The question has to do with the Japanese. The Japanese are the world's lar second largest economy. And at the end of the 1980s, they accounted for 44% for of the value of global stocks and 35% of global lending. They have a huge trade surplus. Part of the reason the yen increased against the dollar over recent months, until well, it's, it's weakened lately, but until the last few weeks, it increased against the dollar, was because Japanese interest rates doubled 
and huge amounts of yen were repatriated from overseas by, in fact, selling U.S. Treasury debt to come back and meet uh, government requirements for the Japanese bank at the end of their fiscal year, which is again, again this month, end of this month, March 31. Right now, they're not in trouble. The yen's holding above 0 0.80 against the U.S. dollar, and the Nikkei Dow has broken out above 15,000. So it, it stays at this level. The banks are not going to have the difficulty. Now, what happens at the end of this time period is, is anybody's guess. In fact, one of the concerns is once this is passed, the, will they then breathe easy an, uh, another year? And because of the tremendous disparity of interest earnings in the U.S. versus those in Japan, we'll have more money flow back into this country. It's really a flip of the coin here. The point is the Japanese and the average household there has like $60,000 of savings. But their postal system savings system, which is a bait primarily like T-bills are here, there's a scandal raging over there right now that it's effectively bankrupt, in which case we could have absolute chaos in the Japanese uh, com consumer sector and even the postal system and banking uh, segment later on this year. There's no signs, by the way, that the Japanese economy is recovering, and it needs to recover if Asia is going to recover. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, Ari. Um, hi. I uh, remember at the beginning of your talk that you were talking about um, uh, foreign investors, fo worried foreign investors from abroad were coming mm -hmm. here and investing, and I think you said T-bills. Yeah. So th I'm wondering if that makes us a little bit like Switzerland has been over the decades. That's a good analogy. In fact, well, you can imagine, well, scared money in, in Asia or Latin America or even Europe are saying, well, the only country looking forward, the only country right now that's, of, of, that's the biggest and that has the healthiest economy of the five that are prepared is the U.S. So why not invest in the biggest 50 to 100 U.S. stocks, blue chip stocks? Why not own U.S. Treasury notes or T-bills less than two years where basically the yield curve is flat? We don't have to go out 30 years to hold U.S. debt. So, so we are having some of that. Question, question being is how long it's going to continue. I suspect that will be pretty well completed by the end of third quarter this year. Okay. Thanks. Okay. You mentioned the IRS um, oh, is I? in trouble. Yeah, I remember. Um, it's probably going to be in trouble at Y2K. Do you have any idea what that what might be replaced by that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do. Th I do think that the, the IRS crisis f will create severe problems for the U.S. Treasury debt, as will any type of recession or contraction in the economy in terms of the the, the federal deficit. And my guess is it'll force the Congress. Uh, under, the, under the new president to, to make some drastic reforms by way of tax collection, either, either into a national sales tax or a, a flat, flat income tax, something of that nature, because the system as it operates now, coupled with the problems of contracting the economy, could cause such a crisis in 2000, 2001, 2002 that I, I, I suspect there's better than a two-thirds chance we'll see an overhaul in the system. Yes, sir. This might not be your area of expertise, but uh, how is this going to affect the uh, world mafia? What world mafia? <laughs> <laughs> I have no comment. What's your views on gold and silver? My views on gold and silver? Uh, gold and silver are the only money which historically are not someone else's liability or someone else's debt. So historically, they're real grounded money. Now that's that, and so I keep and advise my investors and clients to keep 10% of their portfolio at all times in, in in what I call insurance money, and that may be in form of of, of well-selected gold stocks that could benefit from a run-up in gold, or it could be gold coins or numismatic coins, collector coins, or silver coins pre-1965 or so. Um, we have seen a tremendous demand for gold and silver coins. The U.S. Treasury has basically run out of gold and silver. I mean, the mint the mint is the mint says. Hey, we, we, we don't have the material, the gold and silver bullion necessary to make the, command, the coins to keep up with the demand. So functionally, if we see gold close above $300 an ounce, I expect it to skyrocket very, very quickly. And the Fed would hate to see that because that will be a key inflationary sign that could kick off inflationary expectations for the U.S. economy, kick the dollar down, kick interest rates higher, kick T-bonds down, kick the stock market down. So gold is, is a real danger to the monetary establishment right now. Silver. Yeah. Closing above 550, I think, will confirm uh, a continuation of the uptrend. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett's report from uh, Berkshire Hathaway comes out this Saturday on, on what he has done with the, you know, the what, 129 million, million troll ounce, ounces or so of silver that, that they hold. The um, market's waiting for that, and silver's uh, biding time right now. I, pl I play them from the long side right now. Gold will have to, b have to break the, the 278 level on a close to turn bearish, but if it does, I think it'd break uh, quickly to 250. 
Yes, sir. Better coins than bullion? Uh, in terms of Y2K preparation, yes, uh, you know, it's like how much money do you have? You know, if you don't have a whole lot of money, then you, you, know, you, go, you go in the coins. And that's where the premium has been, uh, clearly, lately because of the Y2K preparations. Uh, more exotic investors, of course, you know, play, play the leverage gold stocks or in the bullion or hold it in overseas banks, things of that nature. Some of the big banks uh, the, that I think will do well, by the way, are some of the British banks. Standard Charter, Bank of Scotland, I think are some of the best bar banks in the world. Barclays. Yes, ma'am. Let's talk a little bit about Let's the um, electric grid. Uh -huh. um, I've been listening and reading a lot on the internet, the different experts, and listening to the uh, radio talk shows and everything, experts talking about the electric grid. And I've come to the conclusion, if we can keep it up, <laughs> uh, some say that not one electric company in the United States is compliant yet. Others are talking about the NERC, the Nuclear Regulatory Board, closing down all the plants that are run by nuclear. And others are talking about disconnecting from the grid so that they would maintain all their electricity in the city. And so all those in the outlying areas would not have any. So, you know, we, we think about, well, let's go to the country, to the mountains or something where it would be safe, but you won't have any electricity. If you stay in the city, you'll have electricity. Possibility. So what do you know about that? You, you know, that that is a widely disputed question, and the truth is no one really does know. The uh, I, I spent last, uh, mm, I think it was Thursday night a week ago on the phone for an hour with a gentleman who's one of the key troubleshooters globally on nuclear and electrical power plants. And he is convinced that the capability does exist for most people to maintain power or to get most pe power up to, let's say, 80, 90 percent of the people within a three to five day period. But, but then there are the others who say because of the interconnected nature of the, of the grid and because they don't have the, the staff basically to man these on a manual basis 24 hours a day, that there's no way that can occur. So my perspective is, well, you know, I'm going to have a wood stove, an extra cart of wood, and a Coleman stove, and, and some Coleman fuel, and a lot of extra batteries, and, and things necessary to keep warm, warm clothes, sleeping bag, things of that nature. Uh, got a tin, tin bucket so I can put it on top of my wood stove. I need to want to take a hot water shower, things of that nature. I mean, I, I think preparations like that do make sense. Uh, how much do you want to? How much do you want to prepare for? I mean, that's a, that's that's a that's a. I think we could have problems in the electric grid. I think that'll be the one that in the financial system will be the two areas that receive primary attention. I would expect those problems to be pretty well under hand within 90 days. But you see, if we lose the electric grid, that the grocery stores use their scanners and everything that's like exactly that. That's exactly right. That's and exactly right. And if people right. have not prepared, that's right. Then that's, that's where cash. Start that's where cash is king then they're going to start panicking and then rioting in the cities. And that's why the National Guard is prepared for in terms of 120 cities is being right. prepared. Okay. That's exactly right. And there's no question that's, that's the big wild card in the system is the electrical grid. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, do you think nuclear energy will be the system we'll be using in the year 2000 and on instead of all these other systems of... Uh, you know, the hydrocarbons, et cetera? I mean, in, in next year? Well, I'd say, yeah, in the next thousand years. No. You don't? Mm -mm. Oh, well, I do. Oh, good. I hope, well, <laughs> good. Okay, that's all I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know the answer to this one, so I'll take it, whatever you say. All right, you got the 100, what is it? You said 120 cities are going to be yes. uh, back to New York. Is that the uh, script? No, about 120 cities are, are, are the National Guard is being prepared in case of emergency to be called out to But you said isolate. Isolated and protected. Okay, That's does that right. mean they uh, create you, the... Uh, usually keep, uh, you know, no one in, no one out type thing right. without being so, monitored. So what does that mean? That type of situation? Yes, what are we creating there? Well, the declaration of national emergency or, or martial law means that basically the only people that move and the only systems that move are those that basically have been given approval or license to move. That's okay, what but, that means. But we got a city and we got a situation. We got no, no transportation, no food coming into the city. Well, we th they would make sure food, that's the whole point. They would make sure, let's say, everyone gives up their guns and ammunition in exchange for food or takes a registration card in exchange for food or, or things of that nature. 
a national emergency is a national emergency. You know, if you live in the, if you live in a city and, and, and uh -huh. basically if you want it food and water and basic services, you're going to do what they tell you to do. That's what a national emergency is. So you think it might be better to get a wind generator and go up on a hill? I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I didn't say that. I, I think. Uh, uh, hmm. I think, therefore, I am. Go ahead. <laughs> what is your general feeling of the what the Dow is going to do in the next for the balance of the year? I think. I think these. This, I think we're in a situation where the S and P and the Dow just made new highs on very, very narrow breadth. Very, very. Uh, insignificant leadership, and I'm looking for a place to increase my short position. Frankly, now it could they these big these big blue chips again could go higher due to this Y2K problem and or heavy leverage buying, just to get it above 10,000 or so. But this this market has all the earmarks of, of bearish divergence and distribution in terms of the advanced decline line, in terms of, of a poor breadth, uh, negative. Uh, uh, confirmation in terms of the Russell 2000, the value line, the Dow Jones transports, all, none of which are making new highs. And, all, and again, very, very few select stocks, maybe 25 on the NASDAQ, uh, primarily the high-tech stocks on the, on the S&P 500, a few internet stocks that are very, very, uh, very thinly traded in addition to the big uh, 50 to 100 blue caps. So it's, it's a market where I would keep, if I, was, if I were long stocks and those, I would keep a closer protective stop. Excuse me. So if the market does break down, you know the, it will take you out of it with profits, or at least take some scale up profits on the way up. Remember, your odds of picking a top or a bottom in the market are only one out of two hundred, and so you don't have to buy or sell all at once. You can sell a little bit down to a sleeping level, use some money for something else, diversify, and sell some more. Most people think that well, I, I gosh, if I have hundred thousand dollars in the stock market, I got to sell it all. Well, why? Why not sell you know, 20000 now and see where, how you feel about it and see how things are going, maybe another 20000 later, and do it in fifths? It's one of the things I talk about in this book, The Art of the Trade, is that money management long term is more important to preservation and increase of wealth than any other factor. Money management, and anybody can do that just with a little training and discipline. Well, yes, sir. Right now with somebody <coughs> that's in the market, leaps long term short. Uh, oh, the leap leaps puts on the S&P? Yes. Yeah, the, that, that, that's something I've done. Rydex Ursula Fund is, is another way of shorting, uh, buying puts when, you, when they're cheap on, on the Dow Futures contract or the S&P 500 when, you, when they're blow out to new highs, like let's say in the December contract. That's something, in fact, I'll be looking at very carefully uh, personally and for my clients when I return on Monday. Next. Yeah, just a quick uh, observation and maybe your opinion on it. Uh, you mentioned earlier the uh, new president, and you also mentioned uh, – Martial law. Uh, what what would you think would happen if we were under martial law in November of uh, 2000? Would elections take place under those conditions? We never had that tested in this country. I well, down in Texas, we hope so, because you know Bush Light's got a pretty good chance of being elected. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ari, uh, what do you think about um, if you if you uh, take your money out or a lot of your money out of the, of the bank or portfolio and put it in a money market fund, which is with your broker instead of with a bank, would that be a little safer than, and you can get it out when you want it that way, do you to, think? To the, okay, to the degree that the, your brokerage firm is large enough that it does basically buy those T-bills directly at the treasury auctions as opposed to going through a bank, yes, that would, that would be a good way of diversifying. Like I said, you know, holding some cash, holding some cash in a safe deposit box, holding some CDs in a local bank, holding some money market T-bills in a brokerage firm where basically they're buying at an auction for you every so month, you things of that nature. So you should ask them how they're getting yes, the money. Yes, how, how do they, how do they, if they're using the bank, you're saying, well, you know, why not me, you know? Sometimes you can't, a lot of banks these days have backed out of buying T-bills for, for clients. They, did, used to, they used to buy them for you. Now, a lot more times than not, you need to go through a brokerage firm. And those are usually segregated accounts that are outside of the control of the brokerage firm uh, in terms of the T-bills that they're buying directly and yes. depositing your account. And that's different. That's your own brokerage account. Like they may, let's say you have a, a $30,000 commodity trading account. You might buy $25,000 worth of T-bill that you can use as the original margin, but they're actually T-bills in your name. That's different than putting, let's say, $30,000 in a money market mutual fund that invests only in T-bills, such as Capital Preservation Fund 1. That's different. You understand the difference? Sort of. I well, your own account, 
they, they may very well buy T-bills in your own account, and they can do that. Uh-huh. That's good. Yes, if, if, particularly if they buy it directly from the Treasury as opposed to going through a bank. Another way of doing it is, is to invest in, in a family of mutual funds. In some of these family like Fidelity and, and, and American Century, they have mutual funds that invest only in U.S. T-bills. Example I gave, Capital Preservation Fund 1. So you're with everyone else's money, but they're all invested in T-bills. So that's, that's also an alternative that's reasonable. Uh, okay. Okay. Can you please explain uh, derivatives to me? Please, let's see. How, how many hours do I have left to explain derivatives? <laughs> Basically, derivatives have become an umbrella or a catch-all for leveraged positions that are ostensibly are used to hedge long positions in either stocks, bonds, currencies, and all as a form of insurance to offset risk. In truth, more times than not, they are a speculative vehicle with high leverage by which someone is attempting to get rich by beating the timing game. Example, I own uh, 100 ounces of gold. Let's make, the, make, make it simple, 100 ounces of gold, and uh, I think the gold price is going down. I might buy a put option in gold, which basically is an option to, or, to sell 100 ounces of gold. So if gold goes down, my inventory of gold, that would be a derivative. My gold that I hold physically, those 100 ounces, would decrease in price, but theoretically, my, the value of my put option would, inc would increase in price as prices go down because I actually sold them. So it's an offset as, as, and usually should be used as an insurance function. That's what a derivative is. Problem is more, more banks and individuals and hedge funds really use them as speculative vehicles. Ari, are you familiar with any regulation that prohibits people from buying more than a certain amount of freeze-dried or, or uh, um, dehydrated food? I was told by somebody you could only buy 20 cans or cases or... I'm not familiar with the regulation, except I know that there's been a great deal of... And there may, there may, however, be in FEMA some obscure regulation against, quote, hoarding, unquote. Now, what level that is, no one knows. I don't know. Oh, she says in the terrorist bill, you're talking about one of these uh, uh, executive orders? No. The anti-terrorism bill. There's anti-terrorism bill. But I'm not familiar with that regulation. I just know there, there are some, there's some general on the books among the f federal statutes from the alphabet agencies, prohibitions against, quote, hoarding. Now, what that amounts to is anyone's guess. But I, I don't think it's going to be a big issue because you've had some major U.S. senators and, and, Senate, and, and Senate and House committees say people should make some basic preparations. This has been on mass media in anticipation of Y2K. So I don't think preparations that are made openly for that type of of, of situation will be subject to attack. That's why I think getting cash out of the bank that's well reported with treasury forms filled out and, and reasons given makes sense. But there is a law against structuring and, and, and secretly and, and being clandestine about taking cash out of banks and things of that nature. You don't want to do that. That's a, that's a big no-no. Is there a chance of stopping this bill of the know your customer? I think it is stopped. I think the, pr the press has been so strong, the mail, the mail has been so overwhelmingly negative against it, the know your customer uh, uh, provision is now, as far as I'm concerned, dead. Oh, I, don't, I, don't th I don't think it's a risk anymore. All right, good. <laughs> I'm surprised One or two group, more. I'm surprised this group has so many questions about money. I mean, we should be talking about flying saucers and levitating and, and, and crystal blue persuasions and purple auras and... <laughs> Heart chakras and <laughs> see if I get some money to levitate with my heart chakra. Silver coin. Go ahead. I Sorry. just want to uh, address her question. It's um, there is a statute about three months. Uh, they consider three months or more hoarding. Um, but I, I, like you said, I don't think they're going to do anything on this Y2K. And under the question that Dean was asking. What if you eat a lot? How, who's decide what's three months for me is not three months for you? I mean, you know, I know some families that, you know, eat in three months what I'd eat in a year. <laughs> well, I listen to a lot of talk show. Oh, I see. And, the, and they discuss uh, Those are good sources of advice. <laughs> they discuss it a lot, you know, and they, and they talk about the uh, FEMA and their rules and regulations and everything I see. like that. I Okay. But um, the, 
the ones that complained the most bitterly about this know your banker or know that's, your customer that's dead. were the banks. Yes, they, they did. They did not want to do All it. All the paperwork, that's right. And they also were, you know, diluted with mail from, from people that were just conservative concerned about financial privacy. So both yeah. were true. Yeah, so it's, I don't that's think dead. it's going to That's dead. That's not yeah. an issue. Gosh, everybody knows all they need to know tonight. Or we maybe, purposely maybe I have nothing else to say. Nobody wants to hear anything else after to say. We purposely put in a longer tape tonight thinking there would be questions. And I guess we guessed right. <laughs> but I guess that's it. I don't, ha I don't see We're any done? others. Do you have any final words? You, you want to catch the folk? Catch well, you've got to get to the mic. We can't hear you. Who? Oh, all right. Most popular body at this, con body at this conference at this time of night is the mic. Uh. Yes, I, I'm kind of concerned about do we really have to leave the cities, you know, like there's, there's Did I kind say of a, we had to leave the city? Well, that's what I'm curious about. Can we stay in the city where we live and, or do we have to move out to, to the uh, country area, I mean, to survive? Uh, the answer is no, you don't have to move out the country area to survive. The, if, you, if you look at this, the Reaper and the points I made tonight on how to prepare for Y2K, those suggestions can be implemented with relative, relative ease in, in, in a city. Most people do live in subdivisions, and so the kind of preparations you have to make are modest financially, and, and mainly are primarily inventory use anyway, except for things like medical supplies, extra water, extra food, fuel, and those can be, this, those can be done in the cities. I think they'd be more difficult in an apartment or a condominium unit, but certainly not in a single family dwelling. I'm glad I bought a house with a pool. I didn't, I didn't really want one. I was trying to convince Gene that, hey, forget that. That's just a lot of extra cost. And if you have a fireplace or a barbecue pit, I mean, that, cover, that covers your bases pretty much, except for, you know, you know, a little stocking up for emergency. Yes, sir. Uh, what about, like, platinum group metals? Platinum, palladium, um, the good stuff. <laughs> Bias? You have a bias there? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> really. Okay. What's going on is you've got to understand the platinum group and palladium group metals are primarily controlled by four large firms internationally. A and, and they do a pretty good job of influencing price in very thinly traded markets and therefore influence what goes on in the futures markets of those, those metals. Uh, underlying the fundamentals are the primary supplier of palladium to the world is Russia. And secondarily, and platinum for Russia primarily uh, Form, formerly Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. And supplies coming out of Russia have been inconsistent at best, unpredictable, primarily. And so palladium has been in its own bull market. Platinum has been on and off in the way it's, it's followed palladium up. And both those are seen as industrial metals rather than precious metals. And those have really basically truncated or cut their connection between what are considered to be the two primary precious metals, gold and silver, and are moving on, on their own velocity. My perspective is, is that palladium long term is in a long term bull market. Platinum will remain torn between moving with gold and silver and also palladium. And, and the greater the, the uh, social political distribution chaos in Russia and South Africa, the greater will be the pressure on the upside in those two metals. Okay, what about stuff like the blue diamonds that the Saudis are starting to hoard? You know, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Just wondered. Diamonds may be forever, but I don't know. Well, blue ones, not blue ones. Right. I don't know. I'm sorry. You know, the financial world has become so complex that, uh, and there's so many in investment vehicles anymore and so many areas of specialization that uh, it, would be, it would be unprofessional for me to try to comment on every area. Now, there are people I can refer to you that, that do know uh, that area, but it's not an area that I follow personally. So what, what do you see as uh, negotiable currencies of the future that are non-paper? <laughs> Not non-paper? Yes. Well, I, I think the American public has a very good sense of reality in collecting gold and silver coins. Uh, I don't think initially in Y2K those will be effective. I think, I think basically cash, green, greenbacks, U.S. coins will be what are recognized. I think that, I mean, the, the, the currency of the realm. Uh, I'm, I'm really watching closely to see if there's a global shift to the euro later on this year because they have a positive trade uh, balance and we have a negative trade deficit and, and because our financial system is so much like Japan's was before it cratered in 89.90. That's what I'm watching primarily, so I, w I would think probably 
uh, diversification financially into international banks. Bank of Scotland is one of my favorite. It's a very, very staid old conservative bank. Some of, the, some of the other British banks are good, would be reasonable. Of course, you know, if HARP wipes in, well, them out, we haven't, no one's talked about HARP yet. <coughs> like, I guess that's old news. I think, I think the best investment you ever, you ever make is in yourself, in your, own, in your own skills, in your own trades, and in your own health. I tell my clients, you're not wealthy unless you're healthy. Even good traders, the very best of the traders, if they, if, they, if they get sick, marginally sick, it moves them from being successful to basically being at best break even or even making poor trading decisions. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Uh, Nuclear. Yes, hi. 99.9% of the world are on the metric system. Do you see the United States turning to the metric system? Uh, in a global crisis that, that, uh, that Marie Strong basically orchestrates out of the United Nations, yes, I would see would go into a metric system. The, uh, J uh, James A. Garfield said that the metric system was the atheistic metric system of the ignorant masses. Do you agree with that? I do. Well, why should I have a comment? I'm Never argue with a smart woman. <laughs> you know, women say on average three to, three to four times as many words as men say. That's because they both know so much, and we're smarter. We keep quiet. <laughs> That's a win-win. You're smarter. Okay. Oh, here comes a question. Can you tell me the reason for the change of graphics in the uh, in the paper money? Is there any reason? Don't you think they're prettier than, like they are now? Those beautiful. Is there any ulterior motive to it? Now, there would, how would the world would they, would you believe our government would ever have an ul ulterior motive? Are you that untrusting? Tish, tish. Uh, there's a little metal strip in there, in the currency. You hold it up to light, you can see it. Uh, ostensibly, that is to make it more difficult to counterfeit. Because there is, there is, in truth, there is a great deal of counterfeiting taking place, both in the Middle East, among terrorists, and also in Latin America. And it's offsetting the uh, counterfeiting uh, uh, agenda. But additionally, it's also a way of, of uh, basically monitoring currency movement through metal detectors in and, out, in and out of the country. We're in our last minute or so of tape. Uh, R.E., would you like to give us your last gem of wisdom for the night? My last gem of wisdom? Well, how about in, uh, my last, the, em the emerald of my thought or something? Uh, ba basically, you know, this is, I've been in this arena a long, long time, and I, I guess what I, I've become comfortable with and I would encourage you to be comfortable with is, is, is know what you do best and know what you can and, and, and make some plans and preparations and carry those out, but recognize that worry is a useless exercise. If you're going to worry about something, you either I might as well forget it or do something about it. And so I, I think too many people get unconscious by living in, in the past with fear and bitterness in the past but with, with regret and anger and resentment or they live in the future where they're, they're either fearful or they're worried or they have uh, you know concerns about you know the, which train is going to hit them on the track and usually nine out of ten are derailed before they ever get to you and what I've learned basically is that you do the best you can with the resources you have you pray you take action and you stay conscious and in the present. And the, better, and the more you do that, the more you'll live in joy, and the more you will have both the spiritual, mental, and emotional energies to take the best physical action that you can. One of my clients was one time Mike Newland, who, was, who played guard for the, for the uh, Houston Rockets. It was not great, but he had the highest percentage of free throw shots, a number of percentage of free throw, free throw shot in the NBA year after year. And he was interviewed, and, and they asked how he did it. He says, because I am never self-conscious. He said, I never think about what, what happens if I miss this shot or how important is this shot to the team or, you know, how many people are watching me. He says, I focus on the mechanics of doing what I do correctly. And success in any area of life is predicated upon knowing what you're doing professionally, being relaxed in what you're doing, and focusing it on it in the present and doing it the very best you can. That's all you can do. And so in any area of your life, if you do that, you're going to be healthier, happier, wiser, and richer. And that's my last nugget for the evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> All right.